Uh, he's well known for his foundation, publicresource.org. Um, he's got a long history in sort of uh, the deep innards of the internet, uh, did a lot of early work with multicast, including the internet's first radio station. Um, he's the guy in no small part responsible for the fact that the Edgar database of SEC filings is available <laughs> online. Um, he came uh, to the attention of many with his 2009 uh, election campaign for a non-elected office. Uh, he campaigned uh, for the role of being the public printer to the United States. Uh, this is a role that Ben Franklin, my hero, helped bring her out. Uh, uh, and Carl's campaign was very specifically looking at questions of making uh, existing government documents available online in downloadable machine readable form, leading to the campaign slogan, Yes, we scan. Uh, he was not, in fact, appointed to the job. I think this was a terrible uh, disservice. But he did win the 2009 EFF Pioneer Award for his dedication to protecting the public domain. He's going to talk today uh, about another wonderfully named campaign, Yo, Your Honor, uh, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about. I know at least that it focuses at least in part on PACER, uh, which is a system that activists, notably Carl, have been calling attention to since 2008 as this is a system that provides access to critical government documents, court filings, etc., at the low, low price of 10 cents per page, thus guaranteeing that full access to the judicial system is available for those who have the deep pockets to pay for it. Uh, and Carl has worked with other civic heroes like Aaron Swartz, who have been involved with downloading large sets uh, of documents from PACER to study and understand the problem that they are dealing with. Um, Carl uh, is an amazingly effective and creative uh, advocate. Um, he's someone who is deeply, deeply dedicated uh, to the notion of civic information and knowledge, uh, has incredible wealth of sort of understanding uh, around copyright law and access to information. Uh, and is always uh, one of the most creative people thinking about how to use civic activism uh, to make deep change uh, within the U.S. government. So we're thrilled to have him here. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. Welcome, Carl. Well, thank you. I really appreciate being here. I was at Harvard Law School yesterday. It's a very different environment. Um, I actually worked at the Media Lab in 97 uh, um, after I finished running the Internet World's Fair and I needed a place to land for a while. And Nick Negroponte was kind enough to let me camp out here and write a book. Um, this was when the Media Lab was one tiny little building and they had dreams of building something much bigger. And this is like so amazing. It really is a big difference. So um, I started my new nonprofit in 2007, public.resource.org, and um, the goal was to make all the laws of America available. The idea was that the primary legal materials, what I call the raw materials of our democracy, should be available, not on a pay-per-view basis, not just West and Lexus and a couple big firms, but available for citizens to use who might not have a credit card and a subscription and you know a law firm affiliation but also for researchers to be able to bring in all the materials for state statutes, for example, reconfigure them into XML data, begin comparing the laws in different countries, in different states, analyzing how those laws work, how they differ, um, making the laws available to the people. Because in the United States, the people own the law. That's very different than in other countries. In England, the queen owns the law. It's crown copyright. But in the United States, the people own the law. And because of that, the law has no copyright in the United States. Um, so I began by doing what I thought was the right thing. I did a whole bunch of workshops around the concept of law.gov. And I went to Stanford and Harvard and the US Congress. I went to the Center for American Progress. And we had John Podesta and Larry Tribe. And we came up with these principles of how the law should be available. And it was nice, and it was fun, but we didn't actually get anything done, right? It didn't change the way the laws are available in the United States. Um, as part of that, though, I began kind of working on some real stuff. So we did two things that was, was fairly significant in 2007, 2008. I began posting all the building codes for the country. 
because these are the law. These are not advisory codes, right? These are incorporated into law in all our states, things like the National Electrical Code. Um, and I began posting those and nothing happened. Nobody sent me takedown notices. These are copyrighted documents. These are created by 501c3 nonprofits like the National Fire Protection Association, American National Standards Institute, the Association, American Society for Testing and Materials. They keep copyright on these documents, but they want them to be the law. They lobby aggressively for them to be the law. And so I did that for a few years and nothing much happened. Um, I began posting all the safety standards that are required by law at the federal level in the Code of Federal Regulations. And then the shit kind of hit the fan on that one. We got sued in two district court cases by six plaintiffs and we're currently in court. Uh, it's an intense legal battle. National Fire Protection Association says they should be the only place that is allowed to post a national electrical code because if they don't keep the revenue from the sale of the National Electrical Code, they will be unable to continue making high quality codes and babies will die. I have actually heard that argument. Um, and my argument is, well, you know, I know you need the money. It's a good code, but it's the law. And in the law, the law in, in the United States, the law has no copyright. And so we've been posting them and we're fighting very hard. I'm defended by EFF and, and two other law firms. Um, like I said, there are six plaintiffs in two district court cases, so this is not an experience you want to go through. Among other things, I took every email message from 2007 that I sent to anybody, my wife, you name them, and handed them to my lawyers, and the lawyers went through and did searches and disclosed anything that was potentially relevant to the plaintiffs. And so when you're going through a process like that, you learn a lot about federal litigation. The other thing we did is we began looking at the PACER system. So PACER is the workings of our federal courts. It's not just the opinions, it's the dockets, it's the motions, it's the briefs, it's the orders, it's the arguments that the lawyers make before the judge actually rules. And the way the PACER system works is you pay 10 cents per page um, in order to access these. You have to have a valid credit card. And if you're a researcher, if you want to download everything you're going to pay 10 cents a page. It'll cost you a lot of money. There's close to a billion documents in the PACER system all over the country. And PACER is expanding. It's not just the district courts. It's the uh, Court of Appeals at this point, too. Now, in 2008, I began an enterprise to say, gee, let's make PACER more broadly available. Hey, everybody, download PACER documents, upload them to my site, recycle the public domain. And I thought that was just a vehicle for uh, frequently asked questions, learn more about PACER, raise some awareness. And I got a call from a guy named Steve Schultz. He said, you know, Aaron and I are working together and we want to do something. I called this download PACER things the thumb drive core. Uh, the idea was that there was a free access mechanism across the country in 20 libraries in order to determine whether or not maybe the public might have some interest in PACER. Because right now, you go to the courts and they say, oh, come on, nobody needs PACER except for a few lawyers. And so I thought a few people might download a couple documents. It was a symbolic gesture. Well, Aaron Schwartz came in and he took the crawler that Steve Schultz wrote and he went Zzzz. And he said, you know, I've got some data. Can I upload them to your system? I said, well, okay, it's Aaron, we'll give him an account. And I got a call from my sysadmin about a month later. He goes, you know, we're up to like 700 gigabytes of data. I said, well, Aaron's a smart boy. And I got a call saying, well, it turns out all public access to PACER has been terminated and they say well, they've called the FBI because they've been hacked. Now, they weren't hacked, right? There was no appropriate use policy saying only download one document from the library. It didn't say don't download 20 million documents. And I'll admit that was a bit of a surprise to them. But it wasn't illegal. They called the FBI. FBI went away and said, there's no case here. There's nothing that happened. Um, I knew that there were going to be privacy issues in PACER because I had previously put the Court of Appeals online. And I found a whole bunch of social security numbers in Court of Appeals opinions. And I knew that PACER would have a similar issue. So I did a comprehensive audit of those 20 million pages sent in the audit to the Judicial Conference of the United States, sent it to 32 chief judges of district courts. They ignored me, sent them again, and then ended up sending these notices to chief judges that said third and final notice. 
in big red letters on the top. And you really got to stop and think carefully before you do that. Uh, some judges wrote back to me and said, you know, you're right. There are socials. They remove the documents. And I thought that was really good. I thought that was a good thing. And so I stopped working on PACER for a while. That was a pretty strenuous thing. It involved New York Times articles. And you know the Senate sent a letter to the courts and said, what's with all these privacy problems? And the, the Judicial Conference wrote back to the Senate and said, oh, we're, we're aware of this issue now. Thank you, you know, for this audit. I got a nice letter from the chair of the Committee on Rules of the Judicial Conference. And so I kind of left the problem. And then this summer, I decided it was time to go back in and um, look at it again. And the reason was the courts announced, the administrative office of the courts announced that they were deleting from PACER all historical documents for five courts. And all the law librarians in the country were like, you are what? You're deleting the data? I mean, we have a shortage of disk space here. Um, they were upgrading PACER to the next generation version of PACER. But you know, I thought that was really dumb. And so I organized a bunch of letters. I went and called members of Congress. There ended up being six congressmen writing to the courts. There was three senators wrote to the courts saying, what are you doing? Senator Leahy went storming into the Judicial Conference meeting. Yeah, that was the topic, because he's allowed, as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, to address the Judicial Conference. And at the end of the day, we all got fooled. It turns out they didn't have any documents that were historical. They had a docket sheet. They had a list of the cases that had been tried, but they didn't have the briefs and the motions and the orders. They weren't deleting anything, and they could have easily taken this one-page file and migrated it to the new system, but we were all fooled. I should have figured it out because I knew that they hadn't been on PACER in the early days, but I didn't. Senator Leahy's staff didn't. Uh, members of the House Judiciary Committee called the administrative office up and said, what the hell are you doing? And the AO was like, well, it's technically too hard to do this. A single page. And so I started working on a memo on PACER, asking myself, what can we do to raise awareness of this, this brain dead system? Has anybody actually used PACER? Have you looked at it? It's, oh my god. I mean, this is, you know, they, they set this system up in 1994, and it looks like it. Worst UI you've ever seen. No search capability whatsoever. All sorts of other problems. But every time you go talk to someone, they're like, what is your problem? It's just, you know, it's not a big deal. So I was working on this memo. The Chief Justice, every year, does a year-end report. It's typically a eight to 10 page, beautifully written essay. It used to be they do it on a typewriter. And this year, his year-end report was about PACER. Um, I think it's because he didn't like Senator Leahy yelling at him over that whole DACA controversy. We'll never know why he actually decided to pick this topic. But his year-end report says, look, in the judiciary, we have to be a little more conservative. And PACER has a billion documents. And for a modest fee, any American can access this data. And then he went on to say, and we're going to put all the Supreme Court stuff online which is great, that's wonderful. All the briefs, everything. But we're not going to use PACER. We're going to write our own system. And so this rousing defense of PACER. So I said, OK, fine. The memo I was working on, I turned it into a response to the Chief Justice, which is not something you're supposed to do. They don't like that happening. And in fact, my friends at the Supreme Court don't return my calls right now, because I, I may have, you just don't do something like this. But my theory is that if people knew more about the PACER system, they might do something about it. So I have come up with seven different ways we can maybe do something. So number one, let the judges know you care about PACER. Because when I go see a chief judge, and I've, I've met with several of these. I actually addressed the Ninth Circuit in her business meeting. Uh, judge Kaczynski asked me to come in. Their initial reaction is, oh, really? You care about this? Why? And so letting judges know that this is an issue. You know, judges don't get a lot of fan mail. They don't get a lot of lobbying. And so my theory is that if a judge gets 50 postcards saying, Your Honor, I'm a law student. I'm an engineering student. I followed you know, your wonderful opinion in the great muffin case, whatever. Um, I live in Cambridge. You're the Boston judge. If they get 50 cards, 
maybe they'll say, hey, let's look into PACER. Maybe something's going on. So that's kind of an unusual technique. And what I've done is I've printed out a whole bunch of postcards that have pictures of judges, Louis Brandeis. Um, I have here mailing labels for the Honorable Patty B. Saris, who is the chief judge of the Massachusetts district. And we have custom stamps that have PACER on them. Uh, we have pictures of telegraph operators and the word PACER, pictures of clerks with big books and it says PACER. Um, and so these are not souvenirs, but if you want to write a postcard, um, make sure you only write on the left hand side because I need to put a stamp and an address on the right. I'm going around the country collecting these and on May Day, which is also Law Day, we're going to open up a PACER polling place at the Internet Archive. Come in and vote for justice. Vote early, vote often. Uh, we're going to have a PACER polling place in Chicago. There's probably going to be one in Washington. And my hope is if we collect enough of these postcards and they go to various judges, maybe the next time the judicial conference gets together, they'll start talking to each other and saying, yeah, I got a bunch of these things. Oh my god, I had no idea people cared. So you guys are welcome to pass these around. Again, these are not souvenirs. Um, if you don't want to write a postcard, you don't have to. But if you do want to write one, um, bring them up at the end. Um, and I'll put a stamp on them. I'll put an uh, address label on them. I'll bring them home. I'll scan them all and put them up on Flickr so that we all see what's going on. And then we'll put them in the mail and send them to the judges. So we can pass these things around. I have more. So that's way number one, hearts and minds. May not work. I tried that once with the Smithsonian when they were issuing copyright you know, notices on everything they were doing. We got 300 people to fill out postcards, and they went to members of Congress and the Smithsonian, and they totally ignored us. It didn't do anything. So that's the hearts and letters campaign. Let me talk about six a little more, more substantive things one can do about PACER. So the obvious thing is, sue the courts. Say, you're denying me access to the rights of our judiciary and a fundamental premise of our judiciary all the way back to Magna Carta is that we conduct our hearings of our courts in public and today that means on the internet. It has to be available to the public. It's the fundamental check on our system of justice. It's the way we know our courts are fair. Now here's the problem. It's really hard to sue the courts for a couple reasons. Number one, Congress said they should charge for PACER. Now they didn't say they should charge everybody, right? They didn't say that they couldn't make it available for non-commercial use for free, but they did say charge. And if you go to the courts, they say, well, Congress told us to charge. The other problem is there is no place in the Constitution that guarantees you a free lunch. It is hard to go in and say my constitutional rights are being violated. I think they are. I think when you charge for access to PACER, the principle of equal protection has been violated. This is a poll tax on access to justice. I think it's a due process problem. I think there's all sorts of constitutional issues. But it's really hard to bring an information technology issue up to a constitutional level. And we've tried to look for ways to sue the courts. There's been clinics at different universities looking into this. I've talked about this with many, many lawyers. It's possible, but it's hard. It's a stretch. So cards and letters, sue the courts. There's a much easier way, Congress. Congress said to charge. Congress can also say, don't charge. It's really that simple. And I've got a simple magic bullet. So right now, there's two ways that the courts bring in external money. They get money from Congress, too. But they charge filing fees as well as PACER fees. So if you do federal litigation, you're some big corporate entity suing over trademark violations. You pay $400 to file your initial complaint in the federal courts. That is a much bigger revenue stream than the PACER. So they could up the filing fees just a little bit and get rid of the PACER fees. And that's such an easy thing to do. A member of Congress has actually put a rider in the appropriations bill this year that says the administrative office should drop the PACER fees, increase the filing fees, or give us a report as to what their different business models are and how they're examining the issues. So we don't think the courts are actually going to do anything, but maybe they'll have to issue a, a report. Maybe there'll be hearings. It turns out that Daryl Issa is now chairman of the subcommittee that has oversight of the operation of the federal courts. 
this is not something he likes to see 10 cents per page. He's not a lawyer. Um, he likes to break heads. And so my hope is that maybe there's going to be hearings. Um, there's other people on that committee, like Congresswoman Lofgren, right? This is, this is an all just Republican. There's a real strong liberal contingent that, that views this as a problem. So maybe there'll be hearings. Maybe not, but you hope. Four more things, and then I'll stop talking. So it turns out <laughs> Pacer has billing errors. Their system doesn't work. Uh, there are two kinds of things you can do on Pacer. You can download a PDF file, which is 10 cents per page or $3 maximum. Or you can get what's called unpaginated dockets or search results. And those are based on the number of bytes right, because it's an HTML file. It's supposed to be 10 cents per 4,000 bytes. And I'm the kind of guy, when I download my docket, I actually count the number of bytes in there. And I looked at it, and I said, wait a minute. They're, they're overcharging me. So they charged me 60 cents for like a 7,000 byte document. And so I sent in a request to the Pacer Service Center, and I asked for my 40 cents back. <laughs> I got a letter back from them saying, we have received your request. We cannot determine any refunds until after the billing cycle has completed, at which point we will resolve your request. And I'm reading this going, I don't know if that means I'm going to get my 40 cents or not get my 40 cents. <laughs> and then they gave me advice as to how I could minimize my bills by you know, clicking all sorts of weird things before doing my search. And so I thought, this is nuts. And so I proposed, I, I did a formal audit. I, I actually looked at how far back this billing error problem goes, sent a letter to the division director of the Administrative Office of the United States Courts, who has oversight over PACER, and said, look, you're overcharging millions of dollars here because every single docket you're overcharging. It's the most common operation. Um, and then I quoted a um, court case that is used in contracts 101 if you're in law school. I'm not a lawyer. I dropped out after one year. But I did take contracts. And there's a fundamental principle that if you advertise a price in a supermarket, you have to charge that price. Right? You can't charge someone more. And if somebody, you do charge someone more, they can sue you and get the money back. And that's what I told the courts, is that they have to disgorge this million dollars or $2 million or whatever it is that they've overcharged systematically for the last several years. And I'm expecting to get mush back for an answer on that one. But I don't know. I've got a meeting next week with this division director if he doesn't cancel it. Um, and I'm hoping maybe members of Congress will ask them to shed a little more light on their finances and maybe address the billing error problem. Remember I said in 2008 I did this comprehensive audit of privacy problems? So as I was preparing my billing errors memo on this, I, I was looking for public.resource.org on the US courts website. And I discovered I had sent a 24-page memorandum to Judge Rosenthal in 2008 that in included a list of every docket number that I had found preliminary. This was my initial audit that I had found privacy issues, the document that had the privacy issues, and the social security numbers that I had found. And sure enough, an unredacted version of that audit was on the uscourts.gov website. Actually, they posted it twice, one in the civil area and one in the appellate area. Unredacted. One stop shopping for identity theft. And I thought to myself, hmm. And so I knew I'd gotten letters back from several chief judges, but several hadn't answered me. So I pulled up the Northern District of <coughs> Illinois. I took the first document on my list, went to PACER. Sure enough, that document was still live. They hadn't removed it. It was a five-page listing of name, home address, social security number, financial information. They just simply had ignored it. Now, what pissed me off about that is the United States Senate had sent a letter to the Judicial Conference saying, what about this privacy issue in 2009? And the courts had written back saying, oh, we take this really seriously. We're on top of it. We're changing our rules. They did all this analysis of my audit trying to show that I was wrong. They had a bunch of court functionaries write a big, fancy memorandum. But they didn't remove the documents. So I sent a letter to Judge Rosenthal. I didn't say that she had misled the United States Senate. But it sure looks like they, perhaps the bureaucracy had failed her. 
And I actually talked to Judge Rosenthal, and I apologized. I said, look, I'm really sorry, because she was really nice to me. I mean, she met me in Chambers in 2010, sent me a nice letter back thanking me for my work. And I know she didn't post this document on uscourts.gov. But it was a letter to her, and it had her name on it. And so that's a big issue. And I'm hoping that maybe some members of Congress, maybe some members of the Senate, might want to get a further explanation from the administrative office as to how the current situation relates to the assurances that they gave the Senate in 2009. Two more things. My initial idea in this memo was in PACER, if you use $15 or less per quarter, they don't bill you. It's their one kind of free access thing. Now, you have to have a credit card and you have to register. Um, but the idea was that maybe everybody around the country would use their 15 bucks every quarter. And they would use the recap plugin, which takes this document and puts it up on the Internet Archive. And we've got over a million cases on the Internet Archive. It's a small percentage of PACER, but it's a reasonable subset. And my idea was that maybe law students all over the country would band together and there'd be a little competition to see which law school downloaded the most documents, right? And so there's going to be an extension of the recap plugin where you can fill in a group name field, say Harvard Law School or Boston or whatever. And the idea was that the winning law school would get the Swartz Cup. And we have a beautiful marble column. This is Swartz, Law Day. <laughs> And the idea is we would do this on May 1. Now, May 1, you may know it as May Day. But during the 1950s, McCarthy and folks like that decided they didn't like all this communist stuff. And so they decided May 1 would be Law Day. And the American Bar Association embraced Law Day with a vengeance. And this May 1, they are doing the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. There will be speeches. They're going to go to Runny Me. They're going to cut a ribbon. And I figured this was an appropriate alternative to Law Day. Now, I haven't had a whole bunch of law students calling me up saying, we're going to do this. This will be great. And so I, I'm not sure we're going to have a huge number of downloads on Law Day. But eh, you know, I'm going to keep trying. And maybe we'll get there. And we're going to keep doing this for several years, by the way. It takes 10 years, usually, to get one of these big databases online. It took 10 years to get the US patent database online. Um, it's probably going to take 10 years to do PACER. I started in 2008. We may not even succeed in 2018. But we're going to keep doing the download your 15 bucks per quarter and see if maybe that'll turn into something. And then finally, and this is, I think, our best shot. So last week, um, I filed an application for a fee exemption which you're allowed to do if you're a prisoner. You can petition a judge and say, I want free PACER. And the way that works is you only get free PACER on a special account. You're not allowed to redistribute the data. You have to limit your, you know, it's, it's a carefully constrained thing. So occasionally, nonprofits get fee exemptions. So our fee exemption request went straight to the Ninth Circuit and said, we want an entire district, an entire district court We'd actually like four district courts and the Ninth Circuit. So we applied for a fee exemption for five courts. And what we said is, we will download every document for that district, and we will audit it for privacy violations. Footnote, you've got a problem, right? You get, we found a problem last week still. This is a pressing issue. And we will report back to the court as to whether your privacy rules are being observed or not. We will notify each of the litigants when we find a social security number and notify them of the problem. So we're performing a service for the courts. We'll do it one district. We'll do four districts. We'll do the circuit. You choose. And our argument is that the courts kind of need to have this done. But we did something else in this one. We said, look, not only are we going to redact these documents, we want to post them all on the Internet Archive. And we included affidavits from leading legal researchers saying, oh my god, if you had an entire court available, we could do some amazing things. Affidavits from Brewster Kahle saying, we'll host the data. From Brian Carver at the Free Law Project. We have a public library librarian. We have the Lewis and Clark librarian. They've all submitted affidavits. And our argument is the courts have the authority to grant our request. 
and they owe it to themselves to conduct at least one experiment to see whether there's a, there's a better way. Right now, every single district court, 10 cents a page, same mechanism. The Ninth Circuit is a huge place. Our argument to the court is they should at least try one district and see if better public access and analysis of privacy and all this empirical research that people could do, see if maybe that's a better way to do things. And I have no idea if Chief Judge Thomas is going to be able to um, grant our request. Um, at the very least, we think the Administrative Office of the United States Courts will be asked to submit a report to the Ninth Circuit explaining why I'm stupid. And maybe we'll get a, an in-depth explanation of why they think this is a bad idea. So if nothing else, this is going to force them to the table. So that's the seven mechanisms I've come up with on a PACER strategy. Some are going to work, some are not. Right? Going to Congress is ultimately maybe the best way to do it. Uh, auditing for billing errors and privacy violations is, is something substantial and real that they really have to fix. Maybe that's going to force them to look at it. Maybe just letting the judges know. Because when I see a judge and I say, we got a PACER problem, they're like, oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, because they don't use PACER, right? They have clerks. Or when they use PACER, it's just occasional, but usually they just have a pile of paper on their desk, and that's what they read. And so letting them and members of Congress and others know that we actually care about this thing, I think, may, may do something. And maybe our system of justice will work and our fee exemption request will be granted. You never know. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I assume you're happy to entertain questions. Absolutely, about PACER or about, about any other and we subject. We have two that have come in online, but I think it's always nice to honor those in the room first. Uh, so who wants to start the conversation? Better call Saul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I know. Um, could you take a step back and explain sort of organizational structure, like what PACER is? I mean, is there a bunch of, are there a bunch of developers working for the court system and a server farm, you know, buried under the Supreme Court? Or, I mean, <laughs> you know, what, yeah. what exactly is it? And, you know, in the sense of who exactly are you fighting against besides the judges? So uh, the question is, what is PACER? Um, what, what is technically, what is PACER? So PACER is a weird distributed system. It is built by some contractors at the PACER Service Center in Texas. Um, each court has their own implementation of PACER. So what that means is you cannot search across a whole bunch of courts. There is something called a federal case locator, which is sort of gets you a little bit of that. It used to be a whole bunch of Perl code. Um, and you can tell it's Perl code. It's very easy to figure that out. Um, they have been upgrading to next gen PACER, which as best as I can tell is Java based. Um, and has features like longer usernames. Um, they, now, the, when I sent a letter in to the administrator of the administrative office and said, you know, here's my pamphlet and I want to talk to you about PACER, I got a letter back from Mr. Lowney, and Mr. Lowney said, I read your pamphlet that you sent to the director, and every single suggestion that you had in there is something we're working on for a future release. Um, so it's really it's, it's a, a single system per district or per appellate, because now the Court of Appeals all have to be on this system. Um, and whether it's a single server farm, or I don't know, because they won't tell us. Um, they also won't tell us, like, how many dockets that they do every year, or how many of their users. They claim that 80% of PACER users are not charged under this $15 per quarter thing. I don't believe that number. I think what they've done is taken every person who's ever registered for PACER, and even if they're not using it today, they count it as, a, oh, you got free access. Um, I think that's what's going on. I think most of their, so attorneys get free PACER for their own cases. I think that's a lot of their usage is attorneys downloading their own filings. Um, I know West, Lexis, Bloomberg do a lot of PACER access, but again, we don't know the answer to that. Um, and so I wish I could give you more details, but that's actually one of my frustrations is, um, you know, I've been doing this since 2008. I have spoken once briefly with a member of the administrative office. I was asked to speak at a panel on PACER and the administrative office let it be known that if I was there, they wouldn't be there. And so I was disinvited. So, <laughs> Prita. I've heard you 
to um, talk in other settings about other other things that you're going after. I think your free law movement, which is around kind of local building codes, as you talked about, which and I can understand the value of having those available for free. Because in the building code context, you have made compelling cases about how you know in order to comply with them, you have to obviously know the code, and then you have to pay to get the code, which is which is should be free because it's, it's publicly enacted um, or has been adopted by these you know, publicly adopted. I should say. Um, so the question I have is, in the PACER context, what are the what are the beneficial uses to the public? Like, so much of it is kind of in the weeds for lawyers in a particular case. How do you see using this in a way that's beneficial? Okay, um, so there's two two important answers. The question is, what are the beneficial uses of PACER, um, as opposed to the law must be available? That's pretty clear. The opinions of the court must be available. Everybody agrees on that, um, although not all the opinions are available. Um, so there's two answers to this. One is, right now, the courts have not decided what should be public and what should not. So for example, bankruptcy proceedings have an incredible amount of personal information. I am not convinced that data necessarily needs to be on Google. Um, there are some compelling reasons that some bankruptcy proceedings should be, but my argument there that is if it's available on PACER for 10 cents a page and on West and on Lexis, it should also be available to others. So the question is, who are the others that don't have access to PACER today? If you are a journalist and you're doing significant work on the federal courts, you got to go see your editor because you're going to rack up some real bills, right? You can't go look at 100 different court cases in a district to understand whether uh, people of, of different ethnic heritages are being stopped more often for crimes or violations, right? You can't do that empirical research today on PACER. Um, if you are an academic researcher who wants to look at Again, civil rights litigation across different districts. Does the South enforce civil rights differently than Missouri? Um, what about patent litigation? Is that being done in a uniform basis? What are important cases? There's a whole raft of empirical research that we're beginning to see. There's young law professors at Michigan State University. There's a guy named Matthew Sag at Loyola in Chicago. Um, Daza Greenwood here at MIT Media Lab is beginning to do that kind of stuff. Um, and and the, that research is precluded because there's just no way you can download everything from a district and do that empirical research. You can't do my social security thing, right? That's my one trick is I'll download everything and run, run regex on it. It's just, I mean, it's not very hard to do. Um, you run OCR and then you take the text files and, you know, you do grep. Um, but nobody else does that, and it's one of the things I know how to do. I've done it with the IRS. I can do it with the courts. I can't do that at 10 cents a page. But you're not talking about, like, big data. Well, yes, I am. The, the professors are the ones that do the big data analysis. And there's some very compelling big data analysis that has come out of analysis of Supreme Court opinions. They do citation analysis. They're able to determine which cases really are important because they're cited. So for example, there was an analysis of Marbury versus Madison, right? Seminal case. We know it as one of the landmark cases. Well, it turns out Marbury versus Madison was not an important case until the Interstate Commerce Commission began to do its work and, and industry started to happen. And so you can actually see by citation analysis that this case became much more important in the late 1800s. Now, that's sort of intuitive. We could kind of figure that out. But at a lower level, a court of appeals court, it would be interesting to analyze what are, in fact, the important cases that this particular judge has authored. And so there is a lot of big data analysis that I think is significant. There's a lot of muckraking and journalism work that I think is very significant. Significant, and there's a lot of citizens that I think want to follow cases, and some of them they can do on recap, but a lot of times they can't. Often, I, I've gotten this with every database I've done. Right? The SEC patent, you know, you go into the Securities and Exchange Commission and say Edgar ought to be online, and the answer is, you know, people don't really care about this. It's just a few financial fat cats. Why should we subsidize their use, right? If you make Pacer free, it's only the lawyers are going to want it, and they're going to have no, you know. Why shouldn't they just pay their way? They got lots of money. Um, and the, the, the answer to that is you're precluding a much broader audience that, that actually really does have an interest in the proceedings of the courts. Maybe not everything, uh, but there's enough cases out there that, you know, I'll give you a simple example. I know a lady who um, had a crooked landlord. 
turns out he was involved in all sorts of court cases. She went on to Pacer to research because she was renting from this person. And because of, I believe, billing error, she racked up a $30,000 bill. Um, I think it's because she was searching a lot into this, this whole unpaginated 10 cents per page thing. The courts called out a collection agency after her, put a black mark on her credit record. She's a young single mom. She happens to work for a judge. He couldn't step in because, you know, he can't really intervene. Um, and as far as I could tell, it was a totally bogus claim. Uh, but she wanted to research her landlord and see what was going on. And that was hard to do. Carl, I got a, a, a tactical question in from Charlie Dattar, who's a, a former doctoral student uh, here at the, <clears throat> the Media Lab. And he, he points out that it's really hard to get people involved with campaigns focused on the US government. And, and trying to figure out how you get people into those campaigns is sort of an art form in and of itself. So we have mm -hmm. folks like John Oliver you know, making these very blunt statements about the NSA has your dick pics. Uh, and, and Charlie observes that, you know, yoyourhonor.org is pretty dense and pretty technical. You're writing it, it you know, in the form of essentially a, a legal filing. Um, what, what's, the, what's the choice behind that? What, why go after it in, in this way? Are you trying to build a broad movement of this? Are you trying to make a few visible provocations. What's what's the theory of change on this and, and, and how has how you've launched this played into that? I think it's all of those. So the first thing I wanted to do was write a memo somewhat for myself as to what are the different ways we can solve the PACER problem. And I wanted to have enough facts that someone that took the time to read this could turn around and, and you know, maybe explain it in simpler language. And as you can see, I'm going around the country trying to explain it in simpler language. This may be too much, um, but it seemed to me that at some point you really got to dig into the facts and begin to address the issues of, is there a constitutional right to pay, sir? Um, what about fee exemptions? How do they work? What about the billing? And it just seemed necessary to put it together, and that's got to be dense. Um, building a broad movement around this stuff, I have failed miserably every time. I've tried to do this. Okay, I did law.gov, we had 15 workshops, hundreds of people, principals, but it didn't change anything. Uh, I've been going after the Smithsonian for years because they assert copyright over, over their materials. They say you've got to have a license to use public domain materials, and I think that's nuts. Um, but I, I got 300 people to do postcards, but that's because I basically you know, grabbed 300 people by the elbow and forced them to write them. Um, <laughs> so that, that was um, getting a broad movement, I don't know. You know, I don't know what it takes to do that. Um, Aaron seemed to have figured that out on SOPA, um, you know, was able to mobilize along with a bunch of other people, a huge outpouring over a very important and somewhat obscure issue, one that normally the MPAA would have just been able to get SOPA done. And people were able to get a lot of people standing up, but I've never figured out that magic ticket. And so at the end of the day, this is a series of tactical efforts that I'm hoping one or more of them will actually do something. And so there's a fee exemption, there's billing errors, there's privacy problems, there's cards and letters. Are any of them going to work? I don't know. I don't know. But I think you just got to keep trying. And I think it takes sustained effort. Like I said, it takes, you know, you got to just keep on doing this. And eventually, if you think you're right, you know, maybe. Uh, what I find is when you meet a policymaker and you get those five minutes with them, Usually at the end of those five minutes, they're beginning to shake their head. They have some doubts, but they understand that this isn't totally nuts. Maybe it's something we need to look into. And so that's really the hope, is you get enough people saying, OK, I'll get some staff looking into this. Maybe there is somewhat of a pacer problem. And like I said, most, you know, the administrative office thinks we're nuts. They think we're making a lot of noise over nothing. But to me, it's a fundamental principle because, you know, if PACER is behind a paywall, what is to prevent your state regulations from being behind a paywall or your building code behind a paywall? And to me, our federal judiciary is, is like one of the most important sources of what is truly public domain raw materials that we need to be able to access. And I think if you permit that data to be buried and behind, then all of a sudden you get the state of Georgia and the state of Mississippi and the state of Idaho sending me takedown letters, which they have, for posting their official state codes online. And they haven't sued 
because I don't think they have any legal ground to stand on. But you know, the state of Delaware, the, um, the, the corporation code of Delaware, um, has a provision in it that says if you copy the corporate code of Delaware without permission from the Secretary of State, you can go to jail for three months. Clearly unconstitutional, but it's on the books. And I think that's really the core principle, is raising awareness that, that again, the edicts of government, the primary legal materials of the United States need to be available. I'll grant you that PACER is a lot of secondary materials as well as primary, but you can't have the primary materials without the underlying briefs, right? It's like the Supreme Court. You got Marbury versus Madison online, but you don't have the briefs that the lawyers argued. And I think that's a vital part. It's like the legislature, right? We have our laws online, but we also need the congressional hearings that led to the laws. Because when you go to court, you're going to argue not about the law, but also about legislative intent. When you appeal a court decision, you're going to be looking not just at the court's opinion, but at the briefs and the arguments that the lawyers made. And so I think any entity that emits edicts of government, things that we have to like live by, also has to admit the supporting materials that are underneath those. And that's kind of the big picture. Well, you know, I, I sent out notes to all sorts of places saying, hey, I'm doing PACER this month, and all sorts of law schools, not one of them said, oh, gee, come on and come on in and talk, because they got Bloomberg or something else. I am finding all the legal hacker communities and journalists are, are intensely interested in this issue. So that's who I'm trying to reach out to, are, are folks that are not already, you know, having access to the system. I was a little disappointed, though, because I thought more law students would view this as a fundamental issue. Uh, the law librarians get it, right? They're totally behind this campaign. The professors are kind of like, eh, you know, I do justice. I do the Constitution. I don't, this is a legal research thing. And so getting them to pay attention is kind of hard. So again, I, I don't know what the answer is to getting people to stand up and say something. But I'm, I'm trying different ways and seeing if any of them work. Well, can I ask you about the, the nature of these PACER documents when you download them? I guess they're like PDFs that then you have to go and Tesseract on uh, like a billion documents or some, a lot of documents or something like that. So I guess my question is, you know, with say SEC Edgar, like a lot of this data you can download, I think now is like kind of CSVs or kind of structured uh, format. So do you see this kind of first campaign uh, to, you know, to get all these PDFs? Do you see that as a stepping stone to eventually like all lawyers like file their briefs electronically or all this like data is available in a structured form? What is the path? So the question is, what is the technical path here? So SEC um, was actual real data when I when I did it, and now it's XBRL, which is nice, you know, XML formatted information. Really well done. Pacer, uh, everybody pretty much e-files, with the one exception, um, <laughs> uh, my Ninth Circuit brief that I sent in. Um, it turns out if you want to e-file something to the Ninth Circuit, you can only do that if you're appealing an existing decision. And since we're not appealing a decision, we had to print it out, bring it to the clerk's office, which then scanned it and put it online. Now, the folks that do e-file, many of those actually are born digital documents. Some lawyers print them out, scan them and then e-file them. And so the long-term path is if we begin getting broader access and doing research, maybe we can get better standards on docket formats. Maybe So today, if you file in some courts, you cannot have an active hyperlink. So even if you got a URL there, it can't have a link under it. And so the last thing that a lot of law firms do is, you know, they'll, they'll, like my, my briefs all have you know, a ton of URLs in them. This may be viewed at the following URL. They have to remove the underlying hyperlink. Maybe we could convince the administrative office that hyperlinks are OK. I understand why they don't want them in there, because they're afraid that they'll resolve to something weird, a virus will be introduced, you know, whatever. Um, 
but yeah, that's the hope is that if all of a sudden there is broader access to the data, more people using the data, you know, every state has a different docket format um, and it makes it really hard to analyze state court decisions. So maybe, maybe there's room for a standard there on hopefully some simple XML format. Um, although who knows when, when they all get together, you'll end up with some, you know, million options DTD and schema, but you know, you can always hope they do it right. Uh, but yeah, that's the hope, is that more people use the stuff. Right now, it's West, Lexus, and Bloomberg are the big users of the data, and they don't complain, because one of the things they do is they add value to this data, and they try to compete, right? And so it's not like a researcher being able to knock on a door and say, you know, we could do this much better. I actually think if we had a broader base of users, West and Lexus and the others would also stand up and begin asking for better, better formatting of the underlying information. Because it's a pain in the neck for them. Every one of them has to do the same thing that the, they do. So, um. Carl, help, help me sort of zoom out and get the big picture. You've been involved with an enormous number of fights about the public domain, about access to government information. You know, PACER is one that I think many of us heard of because Aaron was very good at sort of attracting attention to it. And obviously, you know, as people have gone back and learned about Aaron's legacy, it's something that people have, have learned about uh, as well. Um, you just referred to it in, in some ways as saying, this month I'm doing PACER. H help me yeah, well, understand <laughs> sort of the, the larger arc of your work at this point what are the interrelated issues that you're working on? How do they work together towards seeing the change that, that you want to see uh, within the US? This is all about access to knowledge, right? This is about letting anybody who has a computer on the internet, and today that means anybody anywhere in the world, being able to bootstrap themselves up and educate themselves about something. I learned about the TCP IP protocols by downloading all the RFCs and reading the things. And that's how I learned about the internet. I could have gone to college and learned, but you know what? I didn't do that. Um, I did something else in college. Uh, but to me, it's very important that we have access to knowledge in, in a broad framework. Right? Not, not just the stuff I do, but the entire Library of Congress should be digitized and available. As Aaron Schwartz was looking at JSTOR, right? important scientific journals should be available on a broader basis. To me, that's a fundamental human right that is possible because of the internet. And the area that I focus in is mostly the federal government and the state government. And I do that because there's a hook. Because with the federal government, works of government have no copyright. Right? We have a right to that information. And so it's something that I can go in and say, you know what? Just give us the data. It's a technical issue. The law, similarly, works of government is a federal issue. right? In the United States, works of the federal government have no copyright. But in the United States, the law has no copyright. State, municipal, anything that is an edict of government has no copyright. And that is the area that I specialize in because it's a hook, right? It's something I can look at that and say, this is important information. To me, technical standards, things like building codes, are not just the law, they're the codification of engineering knowledge, right? The National Electrical Code is the way to safely do electricity in the United States. Maybe it's not the optimal way to do it, but it's the way that everyone has gotten together and agreed. It's an incredible educational tool for a young person wanting to be an electrical contractor or wanting to be a plumber or a factory worker trying to understand what makes a safe ladder. Um, it's a codification of technical knowledge. And that's some of the most important laws in our modern world. Because if you look at things like civil procedure and criminal procedure, most people don't interact with that. But every homeowner has to deal with the fact that their electrical outlets have to be you know, no more than three feet apart. And the reason for that is you don't want big, long cords stretching across the floor. Now, here at the Media Lab, you probably have those cords all over the floor. Um, but again, it's the kind of thing that, that is education about how to practice our modern world safely, how to safely transport oil in rail cars, uh, how to make factories safe, uh, how to make our environment safe. And again, it may not be optimal knowledge. Maybe you don't like the EPA regulations. But if you can't read them and discuss them, then we're never going to get better laws. We're never going to get better knowledge of that sort. 
So to me, it's about education, um, but also about justice and democracy and you know those kinds of little things because I, I think that's an important thing in the United States. We are overly lawyered. And one of the reasons is you have to be part of the guild in order to access the material. And as I've, I've been doing this issue for a while, there are so many people that are non-lawyers that are intensely interested in the operation of our system of justice. And I think those people should have the same access as those that are actually practicing inside. So, so the ideal outcome for you is A, one, in which anything that, that ends up being law or sort of background material to the law is freely publicly accessible and the transformation you hope to see from that is law being more open to the non-professional either in terms of activism or in terms of participation within the system. More open and better. M more open and better. And we're doing this in, in so the, this whole um, technical safety codes thing. I'm doing not just in the US, we're doing it in Europe and we're doing it in India. And in India there's an incredibly strong reason that, that these public safety codes have to be available. That's because the Indian Constitution has fundamental rights. They're like our Bill of Rights. And you know, fundamental rights are freedom of speech, but there's another one in there, which is the right to practice your profession. It's a caste thing, right? In India, you can't say you can't be a plumber because you were born in this caste. And so it's a fundamental right under the Indian Constitution. The Indian standards are all about how to do plumbing safely, how to be a safe textile worker, how to do irrigation, how to build dams. And so we have a very strong constitutional argument in India that these technical standards should be available, just like in the United States. If it's a law, it's got to be public. Um, so yeah, the, the hope is to, that we get this basic principle. In the United States, I've been advocating an edicts of government amendment to the Copyright Act, which uh, follows on Copyright Office procedure that says edicts of government have no copyright in the United States. Um, long run of Supreme Court opinions have said that. The law has no copyright. But getting Congress to say that would solve some of these problems we have in the state of Georgia and with the National Electrical Code and with municipalities having copyright over their, 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 their city ordinances and suing people for making copies of them. Um, it's a fundamental problem. It's also got an effect that I think is really important. If you look at legal tools, anybody use West or Lexis or Bloomberg? Have you used any of those systems? They're awful. Oh my God, the innovation that we've seen on the internet has just not hit the legal profession. And I think one of the reasons is we've got these walls around our primary legal materials. So when I go speak to a judge, I say one of the things you're going to get is justice and democracy, but you're also going to get better tools. Because right now, if you're an internet startup and you want to like gather all the statutes and court opinions and stuff, it's a 10 to $20 million endeavor to do that. And it ought to be just simply just download the silly things. But it, it is hard to get those materials. And so you're not getting any clueful internet startups going after West and Lexus. Uh, the only ones that are doing that are companies like Bloomberg that are very, very deep pockets. And they've reinvented West. It's better than West, but you know, it, it's not, not at the level that we kind of expect from Silicon Valley. Anybody else get good? Yeah. Oh. What about uh, while we're talking about these tools? Uh, Things like the state decoded, mm -hmm. that project. So, yeah. and, and they're sort of fighting the battle in the other direction, inventing all sorts of neat ideas like uh, proclamation of digitization, just cutting the books down and scanning them, and then, hey, I digitized it. So States Decoded is, is an XML format that Waldo Jakeith put together for the state of Virginia. Uh, my friend Seamus Kraft does a lot of municipal codes, and I've actually been very active in that effort. I, I got about 1,500 municipal codes and put them online. Um, and based on that, a lot of cities uh, decided that maybe they wanted to work with Seamus to like, get their code up. And we've had remarkable success at the city level. City of Chicago, San Francisco, Baltimore all have open data available, XML format. It's really cool full public domain. Uh, Washington, D.C. did an amazing job. They actually now have the official version of the D.C. Um, code is available with a CC0 stamp on it, no rights asserted. Um, not, not just an unofficial version, but an official version. And so, yeah, change kind of bubbles up from the bottom. We've had much better luck with the cities than we had with states and, and the federal government. Much more responsive because people read their municipal codes, right? You do a better municipal code, 
and you're the city clerk, we found this in Chicago, that city clerk's gonna get all sorts of fan mail from realtors and insurance people and contractors. They're all gonna go, whoa, this is way better. Um, so huge kind of upside for those folks to make those laws available. What's that glass ceiling there? Why does it propagate to the state? I don't know. I don't know. I, I you know, how, how you get that magic moment where all of a sudden change occurs. Um, some of it's serendipity, some of it, states are bigger, they're older, they're less in touch with the people. The people that do the law are low down in the state government, whereas a city clerk is usually an elected office and has a certain degree of autonomy. That's why I wanted to be public printer of the United States. I wouldn't have had authority to make decisions, but you know, when you're a constitutional officer or you're a Senate confirmed, uh, person, you can at least go knock on the door of someone else and they'll probably take the meeting, right? The administrative office has avoided meeting me, but I know if I was public printer of the United States, they probably would have at least met me once or twice. But Sorry about that. This, as it turns out, is, is sort of one of the great open questions in civics at the moment. There's a reasonable amount of enthusiasm for the idea that there could be change possible at city levels. And you hear people saying things like, you know, mayors are the new presidents. Like, that, those are the races we care about. That's where we actually feel like we're going to have influence. But of course, part of what's going on is that people then find themselves sort of abandoning battles at a state or a national or an international level due in part to sort of lack of confidence within those institutions. So it, it, that question of sort of how you take momentum that's going on at a city level and figuring out how to get it to, to scale up the stack is actually a, a pretty critical yeah. question for the field as a whole. I'm giving a speech tomorrow night at Civic Hall for Code for America in New York. And one of the things I'm going to talk about there is the Civil Service Commission in the late 1800s. Because our federal bureaucracy was totally, totally broken. Uh, for one thing, every time a new president came in, the entire staff got fired and they hired a bunch of new people. Not just the post office, the patent office, the whole bit. Teddy Roosevelt joined the Civil Service Commission and they had statutory authority to go in to the agencies and totally reboot their personnel pro policies. And that is what made the progressive era possible, right? There wouldn't have been a Food and Drug Administration. There wouldn't have been a Securities and Exchange Commission. There wouldn't have been a lot of the antitrust laws effectively done by the Department of Justice if they hadn't reformed civil service. And to me, the fundamental problem at the state and the federal level is broken information technology. $80 billion a year spent on federal IT. I happen to have done a lot of work on the IRS. $2 billion a year they spend on, on information technology. And a lot of that is on Windows XP platforms. They had to get a special waiver from Microsoft to continue supporting Windows XP. The exempt organizations database is processed on a Windows XP box with an Oracle application on top. So to me, that's the fundamental problem at the federal level. That's why we can't get change. Because you go see the archivist of the United States, wonderful guy, David Ferriero, and you say, you know, I don't like the way you're doing electronic archiving. <sighs> He'll sigh. You know, he's got this thousand page contract with Lockheed Martin. It would be really hard to change that. It's just really hard to go in and say we want to do things better, even if you want to do things better. And to me, that's a fundamental issue. It's a, it's a kind of bootstrap issue that if we don't solve that in our federal government, we're going to continue to have a gridlock federal bureaucracy because the tools we give our civil servants, many of whom are amazingly talented and dedicated to public servant, um, public service, those tools suck. They're really, really bad. Uh, Megan Smith, right, chief technology officer of the United States, used to run Google X, is sitting there on a Dell box running, you know, Windows 7 or Windows 8 or whatever, but she can't go, oh, gee, I want to, you know, I'm going to run Unix or a Mac or whatever. Um, it's just fundamentally hard to do changes in IT, and that means you can't change the way government works. And to me, that's something that you're not going to do incrementally. That's my, my big argument with our chief information officers and OMB and the folks, the very dedicated people that are trying to solve our procurement problems. But I don't think it's enough, right? I think it's something that the president and members of Congress and others need to say, this is a real problem. We need to solve this. Because, you know, you look at a lot of these billion dollar systems that they build and the state of California, $3 billion to automate the courts. 
do a little math on that one and try to figure out if you could spend three billion dollars to automate that many courts. It's a lot of money and the system never worked. They had to throw it away. The FAA, the next gen system for the future of air navigation, hasn't worked. It's not going to work. It probably needs to be shot. The patent office, uh, really good people went into the patent office, but they're still running the AS400s. They're missing source code on key applications. I went to see the commissioner and said, you know, you got to have all the patents online. All you got to do is put in an FTP server. And his first reaction, he looks at me and goes, well, you've obviously never worked on government stuff before. I said, well, you know, I actually put the patent database online three times. Uh, he goes, well, my electrical grid is at 96%. If I plug in one more computer, the whole building goes down. And I'm looking at him and say, well, you know, we could shoot some of those AS400s and get you a few watts of electricity, and maybe we could throw in a few blade servers. But, you know, that was not the conversation you have with an undersecretary of commerce. So. Um, luckily, Google went in and was able to do all the bulk patent data and make it available for everybody, and, and it was a big win. Um, but you know that I started that database in '94. Uh, John Orwant, who is right up the road, is the guy that did the Google patent thing, and you know that was 2009, 2010. And even now, they're retrenching. They had it online, then they took the thing away from Google, and now they have another contractor, and it's still not available the way it should be. So we probably have time for one last question. Anybody want to want to throw a great one out there? Saul, close us up. Um, actually, call it two suggestions for Pacer. Mm -hmm. One, um, you know, Michael Moore did this great movie called you know Rob Gurney about the inability to meet with the you know the president of General Motors. I mean, I think you've got a great public shaming case here of the fact that the judicial office. Judicial Administrative Office wouldn't even meet with you. You know, you know, a count-up clock day since the last. They figured that out, and that's why I have a meeting next week with Mr. Lowney. So they they, they understand that's a PR issue. Um. Um, <laughs> the other thing, and I mean, this is something I heard from you years ago, which is the only way you know the Pacer issue is still stuck with me. Is how much the federal government pays itself to get access to Pacer? About thirty million dollars a year. Which is just, I mean, you know, the federal <laughs> judiciary pays to get access. To the Department of Justice has to pay to access PACER. And I have never seen this memo, but I heard from an assistant US attorney that occasionally they get a memo saying, we're over budget. Please stop defending the government so aggressively because we're spending too much on PACER. That's the sort of stuff that when you say to people, you know, it's like, that's insane. There's yeah. something wrong. So, you know, I mean, all these tactics are fine, but on the PR level, you know, those sorts of things. PACER hearings. I think a big PACER hearing in Congress would, would be a good way, uh, if they invited the right people to talk, um, would be a good way to begin turning this into something that perhaps the Washington Post or others. Right now, it's, it's really hard to get mainstream media to write this up unless there's some huge scandal or privacy problem. And you know, We hit the New York Times with our privacy audit, but that's simply because it was so colorfully done. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of Pacer stuff since then. So yeah, I mean, how to, how to, it's partly a PR issue. Um, and again, I, I just never know when something hits that big PR button and people get interested. IRS, you know, you would have thought 600,000 social security numbers in the exempt organization database was a huge scandal, particularly given all the lowest learner stuff that was going on. We got very little press on that. Uh, very little congressional interest. You know. So <clears throat> this is a room full of people who spend a lot of time thinking about how you build popular movements around things. If anyone wants to come and advise Carl and try to figure out how you build a big movement on this, I'm sure he would welcome the conversation. For everyone who's taken a Pacer postcard, uh, I would ask you to please write your thoughts on Pacer, bring them back to Carl so that they can be uh, sent to the state judiciary. Uh, and let's have a round of applause. Uh, thank you. Thank Carl yeah. for and if you don't have anything to say about pay, so just pass up the blank postcards. Now, you know, you don't have to do the postcards. You can just send a letter to a judge. I mean, that, that works as well. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is collect as many of these. So if I have a, enough, I'll put them up on Flickr. And you know, not only do the judges get them, but other people can see them. Um. Thanks for joining us. You bet.